that pre pre preceded all the things that happened in the New Testament. And so in order to really understand them, you go back to those Old Testament times. If you think about it, the New Testament was written over the course of maybe 50 or 60 years, right? Just from the time of Jesus until maybe 100 AD or so, maybe 110. The Old Testament was written over the course of like 10 times that amount of time, like 5,000 years. That's 5,000 years of history. And so to get into that is really helpful when you're trying to learn this, this little chunk of time when Jesus was alive and just after. So what we're going to be reading today is from John 12, verse 12, like I said. And um, so if you have your Bibles, open up. If, you're, if not, we're going to show it on the screen here and you'll be able to read along. So I'll read it for us and then we'll go back and we'll take a look at what it says. So John 12, verse 12. The next day, the large crowd that had come to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, crying, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. Just as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Disciples did not understand th these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things that had been done, written about him and that had been done to him. The crowd that had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to bear witness. The reason why the crowd went up to meet him was that they heard he had done this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are going, you're doing, you're gaining nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will my servant be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Whoever has ears to hear, let him hear the word of God. Amen. So we set the scene. This is the day after this great dinner party, this party in honor of Jesus was given at the house of Simon the leper in Bethany. Bethany is about two miles outside of Jerusalem. That was six days before Passover, and now the next day we have, as it says right here, the next day the large crowd that had come to, to the feast heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. Jesus comes from Bethany, walks the two miles into Jerusalem, and here's a crowd. This whole crowd is waiting for him. They were coming out to see him. And they were taking palm branches and so forth. And they were waving the palm branches. They were putting them down in front of, the, the, in front of Jesus so that he could walk on them. The crowd is crying out this excerpt from Psalm 118. Now, the Psalms were really important to the Jews because that was their songbook. That was their, that was their hymnal. That was the, those were the worship songs that they sang. And so... Psalm 118 is a conqueror's psalm. It, and, it, and it's always read and recited at the time of Passover. So this was very natural for these Jews to be, to be re reciting at this time. But they cry out because this is the final psalm in a, in a series of psalms that the Jews knew as the Hallel. Now, Hallel is just short for Hallelujah. Right? So it's, it's the Hallel is this series of praise psalms. They're praising, praising God with hallelujah. 
and it's the final psalm in that, in that grouping. There's, this is a celebration of God's salvation when God brought the people of Israel out of Egypt. That's what the Passover is all about. And so they praise God for, for bringing them out of Egypt, bringing them and, and rescuing them from slavery in Egypt. And they're screaming, save us, we plead you. Now, that Hosanna, that name, actually has, is a, a transliteration of a Hebrew word that means, or a, a, like a conjunctive Hebrew word, and it means, save us, please save us. It's like the strongest possible term to save us, rescue us from our enemies. We're pleading with you to save us, and that's the name that they shout at Jesus. Great are you who comes in the name of God. And they even say, you are the king of Israel. Now understand, these are people who are in the nation of Israel. They are Israelites. They're saying, you're our new king. We want you as our king. That's what they're shouting at Jesus. It's just, it's amazing. You, he sa they say, you can save us from the nations who surround us namely Rome and, and the, the occupying and uh, oppressing government that was around them. The nation, Rome, was occupying Israel at the time. So why is this important? Why would, why would, this be, why would they be shouting this to Jesus? Well, if we look at the Psalm 118 and we take the context, which is always important when we're looking at Scripture, is to look at the context. What... What were they saying back then? Why was that psalm written in the first place? And if we look at Psalm 118, verse 10, it says, All nations surrounded me. In the name of Yahweh, I cut them off. They surrounded me, surrounded on, on every side. In the name of Yahweh, I cut them off. They surrounded me like bees. They went out like a fire among thorns. In the name of Yahweh, I cut them off. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but Yahweh helped me. So Psalm 118 is all about being surrounded by your enemies. No way to get out. They surround you like bees or like a fire coming out of thorns. And yet, they're pleading with God to save them. Save them. And in the end, he does. And so that's why the psalm is, is a psalm of praise. Praising God for saving them. So these people here in Jerusalem at this time see Jesus as the fulfillment of that prophecy for them. Where the nation, this nation is surrounding them, they have them captive, but they are able in God's name to put them down. They want that prophecy to come true. In Matthew, Matthew's account of this, this particular event, he adds that they also cried out, calling Jesus the son of David, the son of David. Why is that important? The son of David was, was uh, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, the Messiah would come from David. He would be one of the offspring of David. That that, that that son of David would have an everlasting kingdom, that the kingdom would have no end. So this is the setting, this is what the people are expecting. The expectations that they have is that Jesus is the Messiah. He's going to conquer the Romans. He's going to set them free from their captivity. And so they're screaming at him, Hosanna, you're the one who saves everybody. They see Jesus as their king. They, they want him to be their savior. They want him to deliver them, and to be their Messiah. Their great hope is that at any moment, his great power, the power that he has to raise people out of the grave, to raise them from the dead, to heal the blind, and to, and to heal the lepers, that that power is going to break out against Rome, and that Jesus will establish his throne and fulfill all the promises of Abraham and David and all the prophets. Now, they're asking him to be their king. Earlier in the Gospel of John, you'll notice people were also looking for Jesus to be their king. And he wouldn't do it. 
Back in chapter 6, at the Sea of Galilee, Jesus fed people from a small, from a little boy's lunchable, you know, and he fed thousands and thousands of people, and he multiplied that food. And after that, they were like, you got to be our king. Man, we never have to stand in line at Safeway anymore. We just come to you, we get all the food we want. Right? He, didn't, he, he didn't let them make him a king at that time. And in, in verse six, 15 of chapter 6, it says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him the king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. So there were, at that time, it wasn't time for him to be king. And that was clearly the wrong motivation for, them, for him to be the king. And so he, he resisted that at that time. So in verse 14, it says that Jesus found a young donkey. Isn't that interesting? He just found this young donkey. Well, if you read the other gospel accounts, you'll see that it wasn't so much finding it. He actually sent his disciples into the next town and said, go, go get me a donkey and bring it here. He had every intention of riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Now, why would that be? Why in the world would he want to ride on a donkey? These people are chanting Psalm 118, Psalm 118, right? This is Jesus now. He's going to accept this, this fact that he is the king of Israel. So why ride in on a donkey? What's that all about? Well, again, the Old Testament informs the New Testament of what's going on. Jesus picked a donkey because, as John says in, in, chap, in verse 15 here, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. He says it was written. It's written. Where is it written that he would, his king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt? The passage is cited from the Old Testament prophet whose name is Zechariah. Now, if you have Zechariah in your Bible, you probably have to blow the dust off of Zechariah because you probably haven't read it in a long, long time. But Zechariah is, a, is one of the prophets that prophesies the Messiah. And it's a great place to find out about Jesus and what he's going to be like when he comes. If you're reading through the Bible and you're like, I have this one reading plan where you you read it chronologically and you go through the Old Testament and the New Testament in parallel. So you're doing both at the same time. You're going to get here about this time of the year because I'm in Zechariah big time right now. And it's great because this is a mess messianic prophecy and it's almost Jesus' birthday. It's almost time for the incarnation. So you get to read uh, in Zechariah about that. So... The passage in the Old Testament, Zechariah, starts in chapter one and verse I'm sorry, chapter nine and verse one. Zechariah nine verse one. If you're making notes and you want to read that when you get home, Zechariah nine verse one, and it starts out like this. I'm going to read a pretty pretty good amount of Zechariah to you. It says, verse one, the oracle of the word of Yahweh is against the land of Hadrach, and Damascus is its resting place. For Yahweh has an eye on mankind and all the tribes of Israel. And on Hamath also, which borders on it, Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise, Tyre has built herself a rampart and heaped up silver like dust and fine gold like the mud of the streets. But behold, the Lord will strip her of her possessions and strike down her power in the sea and she shall be devoured by fire. Ashkelon will see it and be afraid. Gaza too, and shall writhe in anguish. Ekron also, because its hopes are confounded. The king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall be uninhabited. A mixed people shall dwell in Ashdod, and I will cut off the pride of Philistia. I will take away its blood from its mouth and its abominations from between its teeth. It too shall be a remnant for our God. It shall be like a clan in Judah, and Ekron shall be like the Jebusites. Then I will encamp at my house as a guard, so that none shall march to and fro. No oppressor shall again march over them. 
for now I see with my own eyes. What does that mean? What, what are all those place names and where are those towns and what are they doing? Understand this, at the time that Zechariah is writing, these are all the enemies of Israel. These are all the surrounding nations and cities that are oppressing Israel. And then it culminates in this one verse, the very next verse, Zechariah 9, verse 9, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous, and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So why does Jesus want a donkey to sit on when he's going into the, the city of Jerusalem? He wants to bring to mind Zechariah 9. He wants to bring it to mind to all the people to say, look, I'm coming to Jerusalem on a donkey. It says he comes in righteousness and having salvation, humble and sitting on a lowly animal, a donkey, a beast of burden, not on a white horse or a steed or something. He comes humble and sitting on a donkey. Huh. I mean, it's almost comical. If you see somebody who's riding on a donkey, it's kind of funny looking. It's not, it's not impressive like on a horse. And then it says in verse 10 of that, of that prophecy, the very next verse, it says, He shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Is that prophecy fulfilled with Jesus? Is Jesus now ruling over all the nations? Does he come and speak to the nations and rule from sea to, sh to sea and from the, the river to the ends of the earth? No, he's not doing that. But you see, it's connected in the book of Zechariah. In Zechariah's prophecy, those two things are connected. The crowd doesn't see that there's actually a distinction between those two, those two verses. In between those two verses is something called the church age. Is something called our time right now. They don't see that there's a gap of time that's happening in this prophecy. So Jesus does come with salvation, right? He comes with righteousness in this, when he comes to Jerusalem, when, he, when he's born on earth and when he walks around and has ministry here. That's what the first part of the prophecy is talking about. And the second prophecy still is yet to come. But there's a gap of time. They don't want to see a gap of time. They want to see him come. He can ride on the donkey all he wants as long as he, he conquers our oppressors. So they don't understand, but how could they? They're living through it. Just like we're living through our times right now. We don't always understand the future prophecies that are to come. But at, at, in verse 16, Jesus' disciples don't, don't get it either. They don't realize it either. It says only after Jesus was glorified, after the resurrection, maybe on the road to Emmaus when the disciples met Jesus in his, in his resurrection body, maybe he explained it to them then, and he remembered these things. So the crowds and, and the disciples, they see this as a great and glorious day. They're all prepared for when the Messiah is coming. He's coming into town. He's going to take down their enemies. He, he's able to raise the dead. I mean, after all, he, he brought up Lazarus from the dead. And they're still talking about that. In verse 17, they're still talking about how he brought Lazarus back to life. And they're telling everyone coming into the city about this. They're telling it. The, the people who are coming for the Passover, all about this great things that Jesus is doing, the miracles, the healings, the raising from the dead. But the Pharisees, we see in verse 19, the Pharisees, these are the leaders of the Jewish people, they, they are still not happy. They don't see him as a conquering Messiah coming into town. They see their power base being eroded by this man. And they say, look, look, the world has gone after him. 
It's a, a whole world is going after this guy. Back in chapter 11, uh, they were saying, look, we're going to lose our power and our position if we let this go on. Remember, um, uh, Pastor Matt was, was talking to us about that. And at one point, the high priest Caiaphas says, um, oh, they say, uh, what are we to do for this man performs many signs? If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. So they're worried about losing their position and their power. And then Caiaphas, the high priest, says, it's better for you if one man dies for the whole nation than if the nation perish. And we see that as prophecy from the high priest. The high priest is actually prophesying that Jesus is going to die for the whole nation, for all people, you see. And so we see that, wow, he was, he was actually not even knowing it. He, would, he prophesied Jesus' atoning death. And here again, these Pharisees don't even know it, but they're prophesying that the whole world is going after him. Why do we say that? Well, do they mean that the whole world, like every individual person in the world, is going after him? It can't mean that. There have to be some people around that aren't, they're not going after him, so it can't be everybody. Check out the next verse, verse 20. And we see this. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. Oh, some Greeks. The whole world is going after him. Oh, there were some Greeks there. Well, guess what? There were Greeks, there were people from Greece and Turkey and all around that were coming to the feast. They're coming to the Passover. They're coming to worship. You know, the Jews didn't all stay in Jerusalem all the time. Some of them were, went to other countries. They went out from Israel. They went out from the country, and they were in other countries. And, and we saw in the book of Acts when we went through that that there are people called the Hellenistic Jews. These are Jews who had moved to Greece. They were called Hellenists. And so these people had moved all over the place. And so the prophecy that, uh, that the Pharisees are saying is, look, all these people from all these places are coming into Jerusalem. You know, we see foreigners out there. They're not dressed like we are. They're not, they're not the same as us. All of these people, the whole world must be going after Jesus. You see, so there, that's the kind of prophecy that it, that it is. And people argue about whether Greeks just means Gentiles because some places in the Bible, that's the truth. You know, it's, it's the Jews and everybody else, so they'll say the Greeks and they mean the Gentiles. These people are going up to worship the, at the Passover feast. They're going to go to the temple. Sure, some Gentiles could use the temple, but in the mo for the most part, Gentiles weren't worshiping with the Jews these were most likely Hellenistic Jews, people who lived in other places. And the, either way, the Pharisees say, hey, look, the world is going after him. So, once again, without knowing it, the Pharisees make a true prophecy. And these Greeks, whoever they were, they went to Philip. They, they came up to one of the disciples. His name was Philip. And who is Philip anyway? What's his claim to fame? Do you remember? Anybody remember in John chapter 1? It was a long time ago. I don't expect you to remember, but I had to look it up. I want to know who Philip is. It says he's from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. But if you go back to John chapter 1, that's where Jesus is calling all of his disciples to him. And it says, now Philip, this is verse 44, if you want to write it down, look it up later. Chapter 1, verse 44, now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. And Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, jo Jesus of Nazareth, the son of jo jo of." Joseph. The first two disciples that Jesus called were, uh, were John, well, John and Andrew. John, the author of, of the Gospel of John, 
and Andrew were the first two disciples that he called. And then Andrew found his brother, who's Peter. And Peter's real famous. He's a famous guy in this story. But he's not in this one right now. So he, Jesus made Peter the third disciple. And the next day, Jesus found Philip, and he called him as the fourth disciple. And then what did Philip do? I just read. He went, he found Nathaniel and told him, he testified to who Jesus was. And then Nathaniel made a snide remark. He said, nothing good comes out of Nazareth. You know, he kind of blew it off. And Philip's like, come and see. Come and see for yourself. So I'm not surprised that when the people come and they're looking for Jesus, they find Philip. And Philip says, come and see. Come on, I'll show him to you. That's why I think they chose Philip. He's going to testify that Jesus is the Christ and he's going to bring him to Jesus. So he goes and finds Andrew. He gets a little support from Andrew. And then he brings the Greeks to Jesus. And we're going to see what happens. In verse 23, Jesus answered them. Here are people who come seeking Jesus. And Jesus says something to them. And this is what he says. Verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Wow. I mean, he, he just lays it out there. You, you came to see me. You came to see me. You know, they came. Why did they come to see him? Why were they seeking him? All the miracles that he'd done, all the things that he'd done. You coming to see me? My hour has come, the hour that I will be glorified. In other words, I am on my way to glory right now. And I'm, when I'm glorified, I'll be the most glorified person in the universe. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he makes this claim first. First he says, my hour has come and I'm going to be glorified. That's the road that I'm on. That's the direction I'm going. But then he says something they probably didn't expect. And I, I really expect we didn't expect to see this either. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The way that I'm going to be glorified is something you're not expecting. I get to glory through my own death. I will bear much fruit. But it will be through death that I bear much fruit. Just look at the seed. I, I love it because he uses that phrase, truly, truly, I say to you. When Jesus uses that phrase, especially in the Gospel of John, He's telling people something that's really important. It's, they need to check in and see what he's saying. It's important and it's probably different than what they think. He's probably telling them to change their minds about something. Truly, truly, I say to you, the only way that I can bear fruit is by going to my death. Now, there are three ways to see Jesus in this event of the triumphal entry. You can see Jesus as the crowd sees him. The conquering Messiah promised in the, in the prophets in Psalm 118. He's going to crush his enemies and restore the kingdom of Israel. You can see Jesus as the Pharisees see him. He's a barrier to their power and position. And, and he's, he's not... Their, his, their position with the Roman occupiers and with the people who are in charge, he's a barrier to that. Or you can see Jesus as he reveals himself in these, in these verses right here. As Zechariah 9.9 9 sees him or prophesies him as the Messiah, humble, riding on a donkey, bringing salvation, bringing righteousness with him and bringing much fruit by dying like a seed planted in the earth, which rises again in glory, bearing much fruit. 
The crowds don't have the benefit of hindsight that we have, knowing what we know, that there's a, there's a gap of time between the Messiah bringing salvation and riding a donkey and the Messiah who comes to rule the nations with a rod of iron riding on a white horse this time in the book of Revelation with a staff in his hand and a sword in his mouth. The Greeks come wanting to see Jesus and that's why they asked Philip if they could see him. Those, these are the people that Jesus tells, if you want to see me, this is what I want you to see. He wasn't telling the crowd. They were away from the crowd. He wasn't telling the Pharisees. He was telling these people who were coming to see him. Now watch as Jesus expands this truth to those people. He's going to expand it in the next couple of verses about himself. He's going to expand that truth and give us some practical teaching for, that will help us to know how to apply this truth to our everyday life. What does this mean for us? The seed is happy and comfortable being a seed. It's, there's nothing, it's nice and dry. It's not all wet and clammy. But notice, if the seed falls into the ground and dies, it bears much fruit. In, in Jesus' case, it means he'll be glorified. Being planted in the ground and dying is not easy or comfortable. In fact, it's the hard thing to do. So doing the hard thing now, the being planted and the dying, brings about the glory for Jesus. So he gives his listeners and, and us three hard things in the next verses. Three hard things to do and three promises. And if we apply these three hard things, then he's offering us these three promises. Again, the, the teaching is not for the crowds. It's not for the Pharisees. It's for those who are seeking Jesus. And I trust and I, and I pray and I, I know that when you come here, you're seeking Jesus. We want to show you Jesus. That's, that's our job. We're Phillips. We, we, we need to be Phillips here, bringing you to Jesus and showing him to you and letting him speak to you. And so here's the practical teaching that, that is going to be our, our application for today. This is how we apply this. Now, verse 25 first. Whoever loves his life loses it and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life what does that mean Jesus is calling us to to hate our lives in this world well that's hard it's it's hard to hate your life in this world right this is where we live wait Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Jesus calls us to, to follow him. Well, where's he going? By the end of the week, he's going to the cross. Do you want to follow him to the cross? Do we want to, do we want to be beaten and, and tortured and put up on a cross to die? He calls us to follow him. That's hard. And then later in verse 26, it says, if anyone serves me. So he's calling us to serve him. He wants us to take a role as a servant to, to do whatever he commands us to do, to do his bidding, to, no matter whether it's a, something that's a high calling or a low calling, he's calling us to serve him, to be servants. These are all hard things. Whoever loses his life, or whoever loves his life, loses it, he says in verse 25. If you love the life you have, uh, you lose it. If you hate the life in this world, your life, let's, let's look at it, your life is full of sin. and I mean, there's a lot of good things, but it's also full of sin, self-centeredness, godlessness, hopelessness. There's a lot in life to hate. If you hate that and abandon that, abandon all of that, then you receive eternal life. That's, 
We need to hate that. It isn't simply believing in Jesus that brings eternal life, right? If you've been told that, it's not all there is. It's true, you need to believe in Jesus, but that's not the end. It's the idea of hating your sin, hating those things which separate you from God, and he's telling us what that is. It's the first step in the, in, the, in the act of repentance. We talk about repentance all the time. The first thing that you do is recognize your sin and hate it, abhor it. Jesus is calling us beyond a mere belief in him to a life that abhors the sin that we find in ourselves and seeks to kill it by the Holy Spirit. And that's Romans 8 if you want to look that up sometime. Second, Jesus calls us to follow him. When he says, where I am, there my servant will be also. That's what he's saying. You want to you keep your life, then you serve him. Be his servant. He's calling us to follow him to the cross because that's where he's headed at, that, at this point. So we follow him to the cross. Matthew 16 is a similar teaching, a little bit more elaborate than that too. Matthew 16, verse 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life, you see this? Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You see the distinction, you see the the contrast there. So that's what he's telling us here too. What does this mean for you today to follow Jesus to the cross? What does it mean to take up your cross? What does it mean for you? What cross do you need to take up? What part of yourself do you need to deny? Deny yourself and take up your cross. And then finally Jesus calls us to serve him. He says, these last couple of messages of course have been about Service. There have been elements of service in them. We've been talking about how we can serve Jesus right here at Grassroots Church. And we still want to encourage you, if you have a desire to serve, and you're being called to do it right here in this, in this passage, then please see Matt and I, and we, we'll try to plug you in where, where we can find places where you can serve. What God has gifted you with, what your talents are, we want to be able to use those to serve Jesus right here. And, and where is that? Where do we serve Jesus? Jesus says, where I am, there my servant will be. So find out where Jesus is, where he's serving people, and go do it with him. Go find him and do it alongside. And I'll leave you today with the promises. The promises in these last verses are beautiful. In verse 25, yes, if we love our life, we're going to lose it. And yes, we must hate our life in this world. But why? Why should we do that? What will be the outcome? That we may keep it to eternal life. There's a better life than your life here. And Jesus is offering that. It's a promise that he makes. Lose your life here to gain eternal life. What we lay down for Christ today, he will put in our hands again in, when we're glorified. You cannot out-sacrifice Jesus. Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for us and he will return what we sacrifice for him. Verse 26, yes, we must follow him to the cross. He's calling us to follow him, but what, what's the outcome of that? And Jesus says, again, he says, where I am, there shall my servant be also. Where is Jesus now? What is his life laying down his life? Where has that gotten him? Where did the cross get him? He's glorified with God in heaven. So where I am, there shall my servant be also. He said, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, there you may be also. So that's the promise, that there's a place for you next to Jesus where he is now. The second part of verse 26, yes, we must become his servants. But what does the Father do for his servants? Verse 26, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. 
the promise of honor from the Father. Jesus can replace our fear with courage. He can replace shame with innocence. And he replaces this, uh, what we have now with honor when we serve him and the Father. Three hard things to think about, but three promises to hope for. Let us pray. Father, teach us, we pray, we beseech you, we plead with you to teach us with your Holy Spirit how to apply these truths to our lives. Give us a, a, an idea of how we can deny ourselves and take up our cross. Teach us to serve you and to serve people in the name of Jesus. You are our great God, our, not only the Messiah who comes in the form of Jesus with the, the healing and the righteousness and the salvation, but also in the future as a conqueror, as the one who will create the new heavens, the new earth, and will rule forever and ever. Even so, we pray now, Jesus, come soon. In your name we pray, amen.